Now to the lesson. This will be the last lesson. I think it's number six. On the little one chapter book of Jude. And I will be going back over how we approached it and mentioning some of the things that we covered in the preceding sermon just to bring us up to where we are in the last couple of verses of the book. In this brief epistle, this inspired writer found it necessary to bring up some important matters of which he thought the church needed to be reminded. Of course, again, I remind you that when you read most of the New Testament, you're reading letters like that to individuals and to Christians. Because everything there is something God thinks that once we've been baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins and the Lord then, of course, in the process, adding us to His church, that we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So keep that in mind anytime you're reading most of the New Testament. It's because God thought the church needed this so the church could remain faithful. And we are under the admonition of Revelation 2.10 and verses like that that says we have the obligation to be thou faithful unto death and we'll receive a crown of life. He charged them, as we studied, to earnestly contend for the faith, Jude 3. He warned them about ungodly men who had crept into the church unnoticed in Jude verse 4. He reminded them of God's righteous condemnation in past times as are recorded in the Old Testament. And he even reaches back out of time and shows how that at a certain period, since it's eternity, it's hard to measure, but at a certain period, the angels who kept not their first estate, he punished. He described the ungodly dreamers, if you'll call it that, and he described their depraved state, that is, the choices they made that put them into the category of ungodly dreamers, Jude 8 through 16. And he pointed out to the brethren how to keep from stumbling, Jude 17 through 23. I might uh, indicate further that that's what we do every day. As Paul said, we are to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith unless we be reprobate that is we have quit living like the New Testament said so all of these things are sort of bound up in just a few words a one chapter book that God thought needed to be in the New Testament for our learning for our admonition for our exhortation and even for rebuking us and all of it done because God loves us, as Jude said, and called those who would receive the letter beloved. There's not any wrong motive in Jude's writing. There's every right motive for everything he says, even if it might be painful to those who needed to hear it because of what, how they were living. I think we don't realize how much we in loving and wishing the best and laboring for the best for our fellow man and especially our brethren in Christ requires sometimes painful things to be said. Falling back on the situation with me this past week, uh, they did a number of things to me that were not pleasant. But guess what? According to modern day science and medicine, it was for my good. Now, I could have entered the hospital and said, I want you to treat me and make me well and not give me any discomfort at all. 
they would have needed to have put me in some other kind of hospital if I really believed that. And I certainly wouldn't have liked that. <laughs> so it's important to understand that Jesus is the great physician. And he has solved the sin problem. And he has blazed the trail for us to follow to get to heaven. And we're taught, as Paul did to Timothy, that all who live godly, not like these ungodly dreamers, but all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall tiptoe through the tulips. You know that's what it says. That's, you've read it many times. No, it's very blunt because they are the beloved. Christ loved them so much he laid down his life for them and suffered an excruciating shameful death shall suffer persecution. So sometimes maybe when we think everything's all right, and that's because they were Christians and practicing the truth of God concerning Christianity, maybe we say, well, I haven't had any problems. Maybe that's your problem. You haven't done anything to cause the devil to be concerned about you. And yet the Bible's clear that the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith. And that sums up Jew. Although his message was a depressing one, I guess you could say. Have you noticed, and that's where we are in these last two verses, that Jude ends his, pick, his, uh, his letter with what we call a doxology. Have you ever seen the song book, song that might have above it, doxology? Did you take the time to know why they put that at the top of the song? It's supposed to describe the kind of song it is, what the song is designed to do and the words are to teach. Well, the word means an expression of praise to God. Doxologies are common in Scripture. Now, they usually end a letter. And if you want an example of that, you can also see Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. But it always means an expression of praise to God. Sometimes you'll find doxologies in the middle of a letter, such as in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 20 and 21. And when you analyze them for the sake of understanding them and for the sake of identifying them, the format of a doxology is usually in two parts. First of all, it's an address to the one being praised, including reasons for the praise being offered. Then the second part is the actual expression of praise itself. Now, you might want to check yourself with that knowledge of doxology in the songs we sing and say, is this a doxological song? I don't know whether I invented a word there or not, but is it doxology? <laughs> or is it not a doxology? Because we've given you the definition of doxology. The Holy Spirit had him do that for sake of describing what he was doing and understanding it, all pertaining to the people he addressed. Well, as I say, he sort of gave a gloomy perspective for what Christians were going to have to face and the vigilance they were going to have to face it, and how circumspect they would have to be to keep themselves in the love of God. And yet he has this at the end that helps us see where he's coming from. Also expressing why he could say these things to the brethren and still they are the beloved. Now in what we have said is Jude's closing doxology. We find him then closing this letter that could be a bit depressing. And uh, certainly one that says you have obligations to fulfill and only you can do it. To be faithful to God. But notice that these last two verses end on a very high note. Not 
in doubt and fear. Not at all. No Christian should live one day of his life in doubt and fear. Because that's not living faithfully, knowing that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So whatever comes upon us, it may not be comfortable. It may be directly because we are faithful servants of God. And these things to be dealt with properly must be met and overcome by our practice of the truth, and that's the only way it's going to happen. He also not only doesn't end this in the doxology with an attitude or mindset of doubt and fear, but he does so with a beautiful expression of faith and hope. Please keep in mind that the biblical definition of hope, as we've said many times, is because of our knowledge of God's Word and understanding that it comes solely through it that we can't get from anywhere else. Is one of those things called hope. We're saved by hope, Romans 8, verse 24. And that means we can look beyond this life by the eye of faith. And as Jesus said through his knowledge of the word, I have meat that ye know not of. Our faith is directly connected with the word of God. Our walking by faith, since faith comes by the word of God, means we're walking by the authority of Jesus Christ expressed in his word. And thus, these are words that encourage you to keep on doing what you know God told you to do. And God's never told us to do anything or to stop anything that was going to hurt us in the sense of where God's taking us. Through faithful adherence to his word, heaven's our home. And listen, there is no other way. Those since the church started who are going to hear on the day of judgment well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the glories and the joys of thy Lord. They're only in the church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. The church to which Christ adds all the saved, and you can read about it, you may not believe it, but you can read and understand it in Acts chapter 2 when the church started. There is not a a person accountable to God who is saved from past sins and faithful to the Lord in the church that did not obey the same thing as did the people on the day of Pentecost. So we have that wonderful faith and hope. I don't care what anybody else says. It doesn't change the Bible if they speak against it. I don't care how much they oppose the church as it's presented to us accurately and infallibly on the pages of the New Testament. It doesn't change what God said. And Jude virtually is saying that's why you can be full of happiness and peacefulness, and contentment at the most dire times in your life, especially when you're being persecuted for righteousness sake. These things are given that we might be sure to live with a strong assurance of faith. And hope. And to help us evaluate ourselves honestly to know whether we are thinking and whether we are speaking and acting in concert with the will of our blessed Savior Jesus Christ. So we want to carefully examine this, first of all, expression of praise that is preserved for us. And this little one chapter book. Now he begins his doxology by describing in verse 24 up through the first part of verse 25. The person. The person to whom praise is ascribed. He says to him who is able. Notice. He is the one who can keep you in the family of God, the church, members of the body of Christ, from stumbling. That God, is, that God is in view here 
is evidenced from verse 25. But the emphasis appears to be on his ability to keep us, his children, Christians, from stumbling. Stumbling carries with it the idea of failing to do what the Bible says Christians are to do. Or to leave undone what he says we ought to leave undone. Stumbling, please get this, does not refer to the occasional sin. But to stumble so as to fall away completely, you just quit. Over my years as a preacher and in visiting with many other preachers in different congregations and hearing them say so and visiting with different members that you've known over the years, there have been those who start out great. You know, Jesus had something to say about that in Luke 8. But they quit for whatever reason. Now, one can be overtaken in a trespass, but the faithful have a responsibility to deal with them on the basis of that trespass. And there's not a soul in the church, no matter how faithful, who doesn't from time to time commit sin, even when they don't want to. One of the things that will help every one of us as Christians, no matter how faithful we are, that is govern as much as possible, by the word of God in our lives is to realize that being human you will make mistakes that's what John is addressing when he talks about if a person says he hadn't sinned he's a liar and truth not in him now that's written to Christians folks that's not written to those outside the church but he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and we confess them. That's said to Christians. And he says, the man that says now, remember this, says he hadn't sinned, that's written to Christians. Is the liar and the truth not in him. The reality of the faithful child of God is that I am human. That's why I must guard myself so much. I must ever keep a disposition of mind that recognizes that one sin. Well, what's being talked about right here? According to even Second Peter 1 and verse 10, is falling away completely from the faith. Now, it does begin with one sin. And some sins more quickly have worse consequences in this life. Because, you know, sin tends to build on sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. First John chapter 3 verse 4. So maybe it's like old Barney Fife said, nip it in the bud. <laughs> First you see in your mind, there's where the battle is. That which is contrary to the truth, and you won't know that if you don't study your Bible. So you can compare your thinking with the mind of Christ. So we do that to keep adding sin to sin because that will lead us completely away. We'll finally quit. You don't play with sin. And say, well, that's just one sin. It just builds and builds. So this is reassuring in an epistle filled with warning about ungodly men who seek to lead one astray. To seek to lead one into sin that you never repent of so that you go deeper and deeper into sin. You know, it's interesting. Maybe you don't think this much about it, but we ought to. Denominational churches have their hierarchies. And they have their creed book, their confession of faith. If you're going to be a kind of Christian, as they would describe it, that's not biblical terminology, then you must subscribe to their creed that sets that church apart from any other man-made church. If you're going to be a B type Christian, then you're going to have to follow that creed book. And they have their hierarchy to enforce it. Have you ever wondered why so many members of the church, once they get caught up in one sin, sometimes they just go 
No telling how far away from the truth. Because once you've embraced what you know is New Testament truth concerning salvation and godly living, and then you begin to depart from it, there is no hierarchy going to call you back and say, you can't call yourself a Christian if you're going to act, act this way. Thus, when you leave the authority, the singular final authority of God's Word, remember Jude 3, contend for the faith, once for all of the same. If you're going to do that, tell me how far you're going to go before you stop. You won't, you can't tell me that. Because sin builds on sin. And brethren can show you you've departed from the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are a mind to stay in that sin and keep going, there is no telling what you're going to embrace for it's over with. That's just the way sin works in our lives. That's the reason you've got all these passages in the New Testament that says as soon as you recognize it, you take care of it. But we don't seem to realize that. But here's Jude in this one little letter saying so much about that kind of attitude. God's ability to keep us from stumbling was brought out in the very beginning of the epistle, Jude 1. He talks about us being preserved in, notice every word, notice every one of them is important, that we Christians are preserved in that shows location, Jesus Christ. Well, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 tells us that based on our faith, which is formed by the Word of God, we are baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. There's not any other doorway into Christ. Any religion that teaches there's another doorway into Christ, other than the faithful, repentant person who confesses his faith in Christ, being baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ is not teaching the truth of the New Testament. To be in, that shows location, Christ. There has to be a way in to Christ. You're in this auditorium. There had to be a way you came into this auditorium to benefit from whatever this auditorium was created for, which was for the purpose of the church work and worship. And therefore, in it, we are gathered together, which again is by the authority of the Lord for express purpose, worshiping God on the first day of the week I'm speaking of now, in spirit and in truth. But I like the idea of preservation. <laughs> I like the idea of physical preservation. But oh, more than that, I like the idea of sp spiritual preservation. And that's what Jude's talking about. Because we can be preserved in a state of blessedness and happiness and glory even when we know, no matter how long we reside in these bodies, that they're going, that's going to come to an end. I always like the idea, and I think sometimes we don't realize, that if this was done for one who was acceptable to God, there's no reason to believe the same thing wouldn't be for all faithful Christians when they die. You remember what happened to Lazarus, who represents saved people? When he died, he had a personal escort of angels into the paradise of Abraham's bosom. Now tell me why I should believe that doesn't happen to every faithful child of God. Did that only happen to him? I have no reason to believe that it only happened to him and not every faithful child of God. And so there's the old Negro spiritual. There's a band of angels coming after me. I like that idea. I need to study a little more about what angels do for the children of the living God in a providential way. So as we pointed out in previous lessons, our faith must cooperate with God's power 
if we're to keep from stumbling or remain preserved in Christ. First Peter 1 5. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And by the way, again, Jude and Peter speak a lot, a lot of the same thing. And they all have the idea, God wants you to go to heaven. Keep this in mind. When you decide to be saved, you are going to be saved by God through Christ and His powerful gospel, Romans 1, 16. So God says, here on earth is the way to heaven through the gospel. Yeah, but Lord, that hurts. Lord, I must sacrifice a lot of things. I enjoy in the flesh. I said, you know, He doesn't ask you about that. He just says there's one way, one single solitary way. And if you don't take it, there's not another way. That's the burden of the message of the book of Hebrews. If you turn against the New Testament system, there is got going to be another way of salvation. But a certain fearful looking to of the righteous indignation of God. And he'll just simply say it. He was not politically correct. <coughs> For our God is a consuming fire. So we must heed the exhortations given by Jude and the rest of the New Testament that says, here's the only way, and here's what's going to be involved in that way. And the old song of the pioneers sing, and we still have it too, there's just one way to the pearly gates, to the crown of life, one way. They reminded themselves of that, that there's one way. And Jesus himself said of himself, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that means by his will. And that means by his gospel. It's not a multiple choice thing. Notice what, what is done in, in these passages as to the matter of exhortations that Jude gives to Christians. Jude 17, remember the words spoken before. That means I have to do what is necessary to remember them. It also, you see that in Peter, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Well, they couldn't call to mind what they didn't already know. Jude 20, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Being saved by God is a cooperative effort. So what is the whole duty of man? To fear God and keep His commandments. We're to be praying in the Holy Spirit, and we discussed that in Jude 20. Our prayer should be the instruction of the inspired Word of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that inspired every writer of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Then notice how it says, keep yourself in the love of God. Jude 21. I have a responsibility to do that. Now look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58 that we quote most often. That's saying, fulfill your responsibility by being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. And look at this. Here it is again. In the Lord. Then notice verse 21. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, that means in order to a given end, and what is it? Eternal life. Where is mercy from God going to be extended and where people can benefit from it? In Christ? The only place. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we continue in faith, heeding such exhortations, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. We know that God is able to keep us from falling. I have never, ever doubted God's ability to do that. That's never been where I have been in my spiritual life. My concern has been, in every single solitary situation, have I been submitting to the authority of Christ to set out the Word of God. God's ability is stressed by Paul in his doxology to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 
3, verses 20 and 21. Notice how he says it. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Paul had some pretty stiff things to say about people in his epistles too as to what they need to repent of and how they needed to order their lives. Yet he says this. That's where I'm coming from. When parents who love their children like they ought to and rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, many times they may something, say something to them in a time of discipline. Well, I know you don't understand this right now, but you're going to have to do it this way. I know you may not get this right now, but around this house, that's not the way it's going to be. And if you know mom and daddy love you, care for you, and provide for you, then you're going to trust us. You can say that about our Heavenly Father. Does God love us and care for us? And does He want us to be in heaven with Him? Well, the greatest thing I can say in answer to that is, yes, look what He gave, that we might be Christians and have our sins remitted and go to heaven. So then it's His way. I may not understand the whys and wherefores, but my duty is to have such trust of him based on his word, Romans 10, 17, that I'll keep his commandments. So here the focus is on God's ability to produce the ultimate goal of redemption. That is what we said that Paul pointed out. That goal is expressed here in Paul's writing as presenting us before God faultless. You know what's on the faithful Christian's mind more than anything else as he strives day by day to live correctly? That is, as the Bible teaches, to praise God and glorify Him. Are your faults and your weaknesses? You're concerned about those things. First of all, because you're converted to Christ and living the life that is a faithful life, you don't want to sin. You don't engage in sin purposely. And even when you've got yourself into transgressing God's law with the sin of omission or commission, you're going to strive to do something about it on the basis of the teaching of the Bible. So the idea in one's mind that someday you'll stand before God without fault through the one way that is Christ and His spiritual body, the church. Paul expressed it in Ephesians 5.27 of the church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it be holy and without blemish. Now, I'm not trying to make something uh, light here, but to make a point. How many people who are concerned about their appearance, especially in adolescence, if they have a monstrous zit appear on their nose, that they don't try to do something about it to cure it and to cover it up so they will look good. When you became a Christian and was baptized into Christ in the waters of baptism, the powerful blood of Christ was applied to forgive you. And as you live faithful to Him, that blood continues to cleanse you from your sins. That's God's cure and that's God's makeup. Because when he sees you on the day of judgment, having died faithful, he will see you as one without fault because of our faithful obedience to the gospel of Christ. So this is necessary if we're to be permitted in the presence of God's glory. Because you're not going to be in the presence of his glory if you're found with fault. If you're guilty of sin, that is, having never repented of it, that if you have not been faithful in all things. Notice he says with exceeding joy. Well without a doubt this will be the condition of those blessed. Who are without fault. But let's not discount the joy God will experience himself. I think we forget that sometimes. When he sees his redeemed ones at last. Why would he rejoice? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How did he prove his love for us? Have you never read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus? So he's going to rejoice with 
a rejoicing we cannot grasp from God Almighty, our Heavenly Father. When he sees the people who chose a straight and narrow and suffered all kinds of persecution. Read Hebrews 11. And he talks about those folks in the Old Testament. Never knew what we know in the New Testament. He talked about them as being of whom the world was not worthy. So through his divine providence, God will bring his scheme of redemption to pass. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Then he says to God, our Savior. Now at this point, Jude's about to ascribe praise to God. So this praise may be a summary description of what was uh, stated actually in verse 24. That the God who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless is truly our Savior. He says, who alone is wise. So his wisdom is seen in his ability to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless. Our duty, to love the Lord and keep his commandments. Having described God, Jude proceeds to offer his praise. Now Jude, I don't know whether you notice this, we mentioned it in passing, likes triplets. He loves triplets. I don't mean babies. His description of his readers in Jude 1, that's an amazing thing. His prayer for them in Jude 2, his three examples of God's righteous condemnation in Jude 5 through 7. His preliminary description of the ungodly dreamers, Jude 8. And in Jude 11, his three examples of Old Testament apostates. In Jude 19, his summary description of the ungodly dreamers. And then in 20 and 21, his threefold exhortation to his beloved brethren. Now, in his doxology, we find one more triplet. But when you really look at it, it's actually a triplet of doublets. <laughs> and it's used in the praise that is ascribed to God, 25b. Glory and majesty comes from doxa, which we studied earlier. It's used to uh, show and suggest dignity and honor. The word majesty comes from megalosume, meaning greatness. These terms are closely related to the concept, in concept, suggesting that which is worthy of all praise and worship. So Jude seeks to have all glory and majesty given to God. None for ourselves, none for anybody else or anything else, but all of it belongs to God. He says dominion and power. The word dominion is from kratos and means might, power, and strength. Power is from the Greek word exousia and refers to authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, strength. When it is said of Christ, all power or authority hath been given to me on heaven and on earth, that's what that means. Also closely related to this idea, the use of these words demonstrate that Jude recognizes that it is God who rightly deserves and exercises authority over everybody. Now I read the passage above my head. And what does that say? Not only does he recognize it, it is his intense fervent prayer that it continue and going on both now and forever. What? Dominion, power, glory, and majesty is God's at that time and forever. Now, here's the point. Who should be on earth recognizing that and by living by the New Testament, showing it to the world? Well, if it's not the Lord's church, who would it be? So it's not just for the present, but it's for all eternity. So we bring down the conclusion with a single word, Amen. It means, so be it. So he's ending his doxology and the letter itself. And so it will be. Despite the efforts of, in, of anyone to turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, lasciviousness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, 
God will bring into judgment such evil, ungodly people. But God will also preserve in Jesus Christ all who remain faithful to Him. God will keep them from stumbling. God will present them faultless before His presence with exceeding joy. So sometimes, if not many times, in faithfully living for the Lord, when it seems the world's falling apart, then you know the Bible hasn't changed, and you can evaluate yourself and know you still love God and keep His commandments. So just stay the course. It's hardest to stay the course when it looks like the course has fallen out from under you. But you can know that you stand on the Word of God. And we sing songs standing on the promises. To Him will be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. But rather for us to enjoy the blessedness promised the faithful, then we must heed Jude's call in every part of the New Testament that teaches us the importance of doing so. To remember the words spoken before, to build ourselves up on our most holy faith, to pray according to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. To keep ourselves in the love of God. To look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. To extend compassionate effort to those in danger. For only then will we be true that we heeded the exhortation to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. If you're not a child of God, we mention in this lesson the way to become one. If surely after hearing all of this and your own knowledge of the Bible, you see sin in your life, and it's obvious repentance and confession of sin and prayer is the remedy. So if you're subject to the Lord's good invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>